let's start for the day uh, as i already had mentioned that uh, we are done with the third module you can observe there i have marked few segments which are to be taught for your for the syllabus that we have taught for uh, cat 2 so it starts with the uh, the chinese remainder theorem a discrete logarithmic elliptic, elliptic curve arithmetic then whole of the third module which we have discussed with respect to des aes uh stream cipher and rsa and for uh, the asymmetric cipher this is what we are going to discuss today and you can see that i have marked only a single segment over here the diffie hellman key exchange so this is the only thing that we are going to discuss today very simple algorithm and in fact i would say it's the most scoring part of your paper in fact uh so that portion is from the fourth module so this supposed to be the cat syllabus the cat to syllabus all right so a portion of second module whole of third module and only one topic from fourth module that's the talk now uh what exactly are we are going to study over here let's see that so ideally over here what we are going to observe is that we now know that how the keys are to be generated by different methods and we know that the process or the algorithm associated with it at least some of them now this particular segment is going to discuss about how we are going to exchange the keys between the transmitter to the receiver all right so that is what the topic is all about and most of this topic if you observe the particularly the first two this is unknown to us but if you see the third one which is the elliptic curve cryptography that actually is dealt with the same concept as we have done for the elliptical arithmetic elliptical curve arithmetic based on that only this will be done and the algorithm the third one i'm talking about this one i'm talking about this third one will essentially be very much analogous to what this diffie hellman key exchange is so although you don't have the elliptical curve cryptography in your syllabus but post cat 2 when we start you will find that these are similar to what we have done for the dh all right and also you can see the pseudo number generation based on asymmetric cipher this also we have discussed in the third module as well as in the second module itself so very similar things we have discussed there so all these things we have already done almost except that we haven't done a specific thing which is this exchange no no we don't have it in cat we only have this only this one we have got it right? but before going to that exchange let us discuss about few things and then we'll go directly there so you can see that symmetric key cryptography however needs a shared key between the two okay and this process that you are looking at the asymmetric cipher that we asymmetric cipher because we have k1 and k2 in both the scenarios so that's why now in case of uh, distribution you can see this point the distribution of the key is the most problematic scenario we are not going to discuss about how the keys are generated like the process of des or the rsa or the aes how we have discussed we are not going to discuss that we are only going to focus on the exchange procedure okay so it's basically a method that we are going to discuss it's very simple it's very simple and you will see that how we can uh, do it is a brightness okay because why this i think it's zoomed in a bit i don't know why acha so let's let's see this first that what exactly is meant by key distribution center now usually what happens that for any such scenarios where the cryptographic keys needs to be distributed for example here you have alice over here who wants to make a call or want to communicate with bob so what the procedure should be that the alice will be making a request to some kind of a nodal point which is called as kdc or the key distribution center and after this is this is sometimes called as session key in fact so what will happen that this kdc will first of all authenticate alice's uh, credential and based on that it will find out some kind of a private key or a secret key to the particular intended transmitter similarly while alice is making the request it will make the request to the receiver it will give the details about the receiver 
and kdc will also give the like find the or the check the authenticity of the receiver and if it is okay then it will also generate some kind of a key for authentication as well as key exchange and after that it happens what happens that whenever this is established after the proper authentication is made alice will be called you can see over here a secret key is established between kdc and each member alice has a secret key with kdc which refers to as k alice which i told you and bob has a, another one which we require and like k bob now alice sends a request to kdc stating that she needs a session key between herself and bob and that's where what will happen that after the authentication is done as if bob agrees session key is created between the two and hence the communication is taking place between the two in a cryptic manner now you can imagine this very similar scenario same thing same process applies when you are making a phone call as well when you are making a phone call if i go back and if i consider this as a mobile device and this another is a mobile device and you are making a phone call to one the same thing happens in between where there is something called as a pts which is the base station now there are multiple such base stations which connects to something called as msc you don't need that you don't need that i'm just correlating the significance of this nature so msc is called as mobile switching center very similar to the same process where whenever a transmitter is trying to make a phone call the authenticity should be checked by the bts what are the bts is you will find in the rooftop whatever is there that's a bts those bts is will check this authenticity that will be similarly equivalent to this kdc kind of a thing and after all that is made it will check that whether the receiving end it is available to take a call or not if yes then a specific channel will be allotted which will be predefined between the two end party so that no other person can come in and listen to what you people are talking that is the fundamental to any cellular communication for 2g and beyond or any mobile communication for that matter all right so in that case the msc or the bts works as something like the kdc all right so the, just to analogous like the similar kind of uh, process happens there but anyway so this is about the kdc but the point over here is that you are dependent on kdc you are always dependent on kdc and based on that you are always dependent on how the key is to be authenticated or generated and all those processes is there so what happens is that not always it is sufficient that we can use only one single kdc and it is okay to have a communication so at that time what happens when the number of users are more naturally the request will be more you can see more the number of users single kdc is not enough and that's why we are going to have multiple kdcs like this kdc1 kdc2 like this very similarly analogous to the cellular network where you have multiple base station under which there will be a region of operator operation so that particular base station will be operating or that of that particular base station will be responsible for a specific kilometers of area within that however whoever with the number of user that will be taken care of by the bts same way here kdc will have a particular region okay and that particular or domain we call it the domain over here all right so in each of this kdc one kdc2 will take care of the necessary end users now even what will happen that if suppose one user is under kdc1 and the next user bob you can see over here it suppose the this is connected to kdc5 so what will happen the kdc1 and kdc5 will talk among themselves and they will also initiate a session key among themselves and based on that a communication will take place between kdc1 requesting kdc5 to generate a session key for the end user in order to make the communication work so this is called as flat multiple kdc technique but we are not going to discuss about kdc or for that matter the process because the dc hellman key exchange is a process where no kdcs are involved it's a direct exchange this is another one you can see this is what we are looking at it's an international kdc we call it like a super uh, computer or you can say in that way that controls some national kdcs and then we have local kdcs in that way what will happen usually if we can if we just analogous usually in mobile communication this is called as gmsc 
we call it the gateway mobile switching center if anyone is doing wireless communication you might come across this is called as mscs and these are the bts's and these are my devices like that yes, all right so in this way the arrangements are made in this way it is exchanged one request to another one after the other all right so this is basically the process involved with kdc but as i said we are not going to invest much on kdc so now if you observe over here a kdc uh, this is a process in fact i already had told you but still it's just a diagram from the book itself so you can see the first time what happens alice is sending a request to bob all right and before it requests bob the request goes to kdc kdc will allocate some private key which is ka a and kb even over there ka and kb and those keys are specific to the end users alice and bob and based on that they are making a direct communication between them all right so that's how the things work for kdc based communication or a session key based communication but as i said uh, the method of session key creation is referred to as secret key and this is how it is primarily made i don't know whether you are able to see it i am not very able to understand but anyway you can see that the, what this what this particular diagram shows us that we don't need a kdc at all at some point and that is the diagram is showing how it is to be then done first of all there will be some public key which will be generated at both the ends so g if you observe that's a public key so we don't we already know with public key we don't have any problem it should be shared amongst every user so we don't have any problem now what will happen after a certain period there will be another part of x which will be a secret key okay this part will be generated from alice's end and this will be shared you can see the arrow to bob okay and this that how this is to be shared that is what the dh exchange rule is but that whatever it is suppose there is some rule in which this x will be shared over here and similarly the private will be shared from the receiver to the transmitter as well and hence all together you can see that at the transmitter and as well as the receiver we have the same set of key along with the private key of uh, of the public key so it's some kind of a process in which there is a mutual agreement that is taking place between the transmitter and the receiver and the key has been exchanged properly without any intervention of kdc without any process at all although it has some problem as well which we'll see after certain period but at least the pro focus of kdc can be avoided from this technique so let's see how this dfi hellman key exchange works because that's what our topic is for the day so let's see that so this is about it is some issue with the volume No. Not satisfied with the the brightness of it. Actually, that's the thing I'm looking at. Can you do it? Can you can you turn off this light, please? Because it's nothing to. okay all right anyway i I'll, i'll explain it i'll explain it one by one so that because the writing i don't think it is that necessary for that matter but you observe the process that is involved so as you can see it is not an encryption algorithm i'm trying to make it as zooming as possible so that you guys can see it so if you observe here carefully that it is not an encryption algorithm it is nothing to do with encryption it's just the method of exchanging the keys from transmitter to receiver just like i show you the diagram in the ppt so what happens is the first thing is please make a note of this 
So consider two user A and B who wants to share the information. All right. And without the key distribution center. Now we have discussed about KDC also. So suppose we don't need a KDC. So the first step is you consider any prime number Q just like very similar to what we have done for RSA. We select any value of Q which is sufficiently large. All right. And select alpha select alpha such that it must be a primitive root of q please make a note of this this is the only important thing of this overall calculation the calculation is relatively simple oh, except that you need to find out this value of alpha now what was primitive root already we have discussed this in previous classes but just to keep in mind uh, please keep a note of this. We'll go to the next page actually. So the condition is that alpha, the selected alpha, every prime number will have a multiple set of primitive roots. We'll see that how it can be found out. But among those like a set of primitive roots, you can choose any root which is less than Q. So the condition is alpha should be less than Q. Right. If it is not explicitly mentioned about the root, you can choose any primitive root which lies within the range of Q. Right? So that's the condition. Now, about the pre, the, that's why I mentioned, hopefully we all remember that what exactly are the primitive roots. But I've just given you one of the example of here. You can check here how we can find out the primitive roots. I guess it will refresh your mind. So suppose we have Q equal to 7. So and we have to find out what are the primitive roots of 7. So what we have to do is we have to take each and every element of the set 7, like 1 to 6. And we have to take the power of it like this. 1 to the power 1, 1 to the power square like that until and unless we get all the elements of the set starting from 1 to 6 that means q equal to 7 so total number of elements should be 1 to 6 so the roots or the element or the integer value for which you are getting the set of numbers starting from 1 to 6 all right those will be considered as the primitive roots for example if i start for q equal to 7 from 1 you can observe that after 1 in 1 to the power 1 and 1 to the power 2 both gives us 1. As they are unique numbers, like they should be all unique numbers, both of them are same at this point. You can see it is not unique. Hence, we can say 1 is not a primitive root of 7. Understand the concept, what I mean? You take the number, so like in this case, we have to the q equal to 7. So, 1 to 6, all this stream of elements should appear from any set of these numbers. In this particular example, when we, if suppose we choose 1 as the primitive root, but when we satisfy the condition you are over, over the here, that we are getting 1. And it will go on actually. For any power, it will go on like that. 1Q, one, 1, 1, 4, anything will be same. So we cannot have 1 as the primitive root of 7. Same way, if I take 2. Now you can observe 2 to the power 1 is fine. 2 to the power 2 is 4, which is also part of the set. 2 cube is again coming back to 1, that is fine. But 2 to the power 4, when we are going in, it is coming back with the same element which is already present in the loop. So we can say it is not unique, hence 2 can also be discarded from the list of primitive roots for q equal to 7. But if you check 3, and if you observe this left hand side, uh, right hand side, all the elements from 1 to 6 are present for 3. So we will say that 3 is a primitive root of 7. So given any value of q, you have to check each and every element one by one until the element q or like q minus 1. That's actually mentioned over here. I'm just skipping that part. It's mentioned already over here. So you have to go on checking one by one until and unless you get a root which is uh, you get a primitive root which satisfies the condition of like this. Alright, so you can check in this example, I think I'll show you that also, that for any given number, you can find it in the same manner, what are the primitive roots. Now you can see that if I check 3, 3 is less than Q. As per the condition, alpha should be less than Q. So in this case, 3 is less than 7, hence it satisfies the condition as well. All right. So that's why this is the only first thing that you have to consider. Consider any value of Q, find the primitive roots. Now, in, in this particular example, there are other roots also. You can see here. 
3 can be considered as the primitive roots. Also, it can be found out that 5 can also be a primitive root. Now, which one to choose among 3 and 5? You can choose anything. If not specified specifically. You can choose anyone as the condition. So, you first choose a Q. Then you choose a particular value of alpha. I told you the process of finding the alpha. So, now suppose in this particular example, we are choosing that as 3. All right. It's mentioned over here. So, you don't, don't worry to write. No need to write anything. You can just look at it over here. Now comes the key generation. Now, what will happen as we are not using KDC, the process is very simple. First, we have to find out the public key. So, for the public key, what we are defining is that assume XA is a private key of A. Now, if I am generating a key, I will also have a private key, right? So, that private key is XA. And the condition is that XA is also less than Q. So, it should be less than 7. In this case, my Q is equal to 7. So, anything which is less than that is sufficient condition. So, that's my private key. And the equation is alpha to the power x a mod of q. Very simple. So, if I choose, I'll choose the exact numbers later. But suppose this is the process. First, we are trying to find out a public key y a, which is given by the primitive root to the power x a. x a is a private key mod of q. So, the public key for the a user is generated. Same way, on the other side, you can see x b is the private key at the b n. Alright. And in the same manner, we are generating the public key of y b on the other end. Now, we have to exchange. Now, we have to exchange between the two. So, for that, let us go a little down. Now, comes a private. This is the equation. Now, you can see. Please make a note of this equation itself. Now we have K1. Okay. Now K1 will be public key of B because public key is offered to everyone. So at the transmitter side, public key of B, that is YB, to the power XA, which is the private key of A. I, I am going to transmit. I have already have XA. I received the data from the other end, the receiver, after the authentication has been made. So, I am taking the help of that public key. So, yb to the power xa mod of q. And on the other end, we are doing the same thing, just the opposite. ya to the power xb mod of q. Ideally, in this way, if you are doing it, eventually k1 and k2 will be same. So, if you observe here, the operations are done at both transmitter and receiver and nothing is somewhere in between. No one is generating K1 and K2 for you. You are generating your K1 and K2 just to make sure the after the authentication has been made. So, you are getting the same key from transmitter exchange to the receiver. That's how simple it is. You will be given a value of Q, maybe a value of alpha. You just need to find out with this equation what are the keys, possible keys, and how the keys are the or maybe the maybe the uh, y a y b the public key or the private key, and that is it. Nothing more than that. All right. And in this case, what we have observed, like I have seen the questions, it's the the prime number and the alpha, the the calculation. You don't require that much of problem as we have faced for. Uh, RSA maybe, the first exponential and all, uh, mostly will not be required. It will be very simple to compute. Alright. So, this is how the things work. So, first you have to choose a value of Q. Ideally, it should be very large, but for our illustration, for our exam purpose also, we are not going to give very huge number for that matter. So, that will be Q. Then you have to choose a primitive root of that particular Q, because usually this primitive root will be a set of Q. And it's impossible if I give a very big number to calculate all the prime numbers within the set using the technique that I told you. It should be a table given to you from that you might have referred or something like that. So that's why we will not avoid, we will avoid going, going into that. But we will choose an alpha. Based on that alpha, we will choose the public key for both the cases, for both the users. And we will share those public key. Using those public key, we will try to use our own private key and we will generate the key. And eventually, in this by this process, Keys will be exchanged between the two without the help of KDC. So let's take an example directly. 
Suppose this is the example we are taking. Please make a note of this. So Q equal to 7, the, the one example that we have considered. And suppose alpha is chosen as 5. Alpha means the primitive root is chosen as 5. Instead of 3, we are choosing 5. As I said, it can be anything. Now, choose xa equal to 3. Why? Because the condition is xa should be less than equal to less than q. My q is 7. So, I am choosing xa randomly as 3. Nothing to worry. You can choose 4. You can choose 5. Anything you wish to. Nothing to worry. It's a private key. It will. It is okay. So, the condition is like that. So, now suppose xa equal to 3. So, now we are trying to calculate the public key ya. So, ya is given by 5 to the power 3 mod of 7. So, alpha to the power xa mod of Q. This was the equation. So, we are just substituting over there and we get a public key which is 6. Now, the advantage with public key is that even if we share the public key, it does not matter to the encrypted system. So, y equal to y equal to 6 is shared with everyone, not only with Bob but other intruders as well. Now, in the other side, this is Bob. Bob selects a key which is 4. XB equals to 4. In the same manner, it calculates a public key which is 2. And again, naturally, it is shared again. Like it, it is shared everyone, so Alice is capturing it. Eve is also capturing it. Right? But they don't have the requisite private key to encrypt it. So, that's why the next step comes in. So, my K1 and K2 is calculated at both the ends. So, YB which is the public key generated by the B end to the power XA mod of Q. So, this is my answer. So, you are getting 1 as the key. Similarly, K2 is given by 1 at the end. So, what we are observing that K1 is equivalent to K2. It means that the key has been exchanged from transmitter to receiver. As simple as that. Alright. So, if you know the process which you might really do with your uh, materials which you are going to take uh, take care of. I think this is the most easiest of the lot which you have come across as a question. Alright, so this is called as Diffie-Hellman key exchange technique and in that way you can try if you can solve it for this and, and let me know that whether you are able to solve it or not. I will not give you over here. So, Q equal to 23, XA equal to 7 and XB equals to 5. five. Find K1 and K2 and prove if DH key exchange is working or not. <laughs> and consider alpha equals to 5. See here I mentioned. Alpha equals to 5. So, the primitive root is also given from the table. That's what you need a table to. Otherwise, it's very difficult to choose. Otherwise, there must be some condition given. Some condition based on that you can choose. But remember the process to find the primitive roots. Okay. Please compute and tell me the answer. XAN will be not given. Yeah. That's what less than Q. I told you, no. Any value, any value. Just check if it is working, the public key. Please don't lose out marks on this particular question or this type of questions or this particular segment in your CAT 2 and even in your tournament as well. This is the most easiest part of I, can, I, I see from the syllabus point of view. This is a very important thing, but the thing is the process is very simple comparatively. The only hurdle that you might have is to, if the prime number is very high, and if suppose you are asked to find out all the primitive roots, and you are not given any table or any reference, but a condition is given on. For example, in this case, suppose the question is changed to Q equal to 23, XA equal to 7, XB equal to 5, and Alpha is not provided to you, but a condition is given, your alpha should be less than 6. 
Understood? Your alpha should be less than 6 or something. Consider the value of primitive root which is less than 6. So, most probably you will find that there are no other roots which are present between that range maybe. So, your, your search will be, you start with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and you come to 5 and you check that yes, the rule is working because with 5 we are generating all the elements from 1 to 22. So, we don't need to go further. That's where the trick comes in. If you go beyond that 6, 7, 8, 9, it doesn't matter because the condition is already satisfied. Understood how the question might change. So, that's the only hurdle. Other than that, the process is absolutely simple. Generate the public keys at both the ends. Share the public key. Because the public key is supposed to be shared, use your own private key to decipher the key version. Is it fine for all? What is the key you are getting? 21. So, we are getting that 21 answer over here. Correct? So, that's yeah, please. Sir. It's given over here. In this case, this you can see I mentioned here from table. Suppose this, that's what we are, in all probability, the alpha should be provided to you in some way. Either you have to give, like we will mention that consider alpha as this value. Or it will be mentioned as consider a value of alpha which is less than 6. So, in that case, you have to take each and every element, find the primitive roots, and now suppose. After 5, like at, at, at the element 5, you are getting that all the say, set of 1 to 22 values you are getting. So, you will say yes, this is less than 6. So, first time we are getting an element which is satisfying the condition, that is. So, 5 is a primitive. That's all. All right. So, this is the part of it. But it also has another segment which needs to be discussed. And that is called as the attacks that happens with this kind of a scenario. Because we don't have a KDC over here. So, there might be an issue with the middleman attack. Okay, so let's see that how we can understand that. This is called as middleman attack. Because what happens is, you can observe that here, in between, there is no one to adjust that whether the key exchange is going properly or not. And that is one of the flaw in this particular TH key exchange. Alright, so what happens exactly is something like this. Suppose we have Alice, we have Eve over here, and we have Bob over here. Alright. Now, the first stage what happens, Alice is sending a request to communicate with Bob. So, Eve is the intruder, alright. So, it generates with YA equals alpha x to the power A mod of Q. All right? Or rather, I would say YB. Uh, YA is fine. Y is basically the public key we are generating. So, this is what the first step is. Now, what happens? This is shared over here. Now, this is an insecure channel because no one is going to authenticate in between. Because we are hoping that this is not a KDC based uh, key exchange process. So, what happens? Eve might intrude in between and Eve can generate something like e y e one And she sends it to Bob and calculates K2 What is E X? What is X E2? X E2 is a private key of E. It will also have a private key, right? So based on that private key, he can generate a false K which is K2 because he knows the process how it is done and what happens is that this YE1 which is the public key of Eve is shared to Bob. So, Bob instead of getting the information from Alice or Alice's private key uh, public key it is actually getting the information from Eve's public key. And as we have already observed that based on the public key only 
it will try to use its own private key on top of that so maybe it will do something like yb which is alpha xb mod of which means that it is generating yb and it is this yb is supposed to pass on to alice but yb is also captured by eve suppose this is shared and this is captured and it is trying to find out y e2 and this e2 is shared to alice meaning that eve is creating a scenario as a leading man of interpreting the data from alice and behaving as bob to alice and behaving as alice to bob it is not the intended user it is somewhere in between but basically using the process that is told to us the process involved with dh we are generating or eve is actually generating k1 and k2 which are false keys and this k1 and k2 are being shared among these two so although alice and bob is thinking that they are communicating among themselves using some secret key but those secret keys are not secret because those are generated by eve itself using the same process because here itself it has intercepted the data and it has somehow mimicked the the position of alice and bob and it has changed the orientation of the key so the k1 and k2 which is supposed to be hidden in both the cases or it should be only known to alice and bob as those are generated by the key generated by eve naturally k1 and k2 will be known to known to eve so eve as a middleman can attack this kind of a process itself and thus this particular algorithm fails to give a full proof solution for the key exchange that is where the next set of key exchange technique which is lgml uh, key exchange technique becomes much more uh, a better option better solution after this but as it is not there in the syllabus we are not going to study today but that technique will check that how the plain text can be divided the cipher text can be divided into two halves and we are going to use two set of keys okay something like that so we'll see that uh, post your cat but this is what the problem is with the uh, age but anyway in case of your uh, cat to syllabus we only have the process of the age and the method implemented for any given data given the queue is given to you and you have to find out the rest of the data right so i don't think we, i will extend that uh, beyond uh, the this part uh, because uh, i might i i would like to give a question on rsa i want to share that question with you so that you can practice a bit so let's do that let me just write it down over here so for people who came late uh, i i actually had given the syllabus for your uh, for your um, what do we call exam cat 2 so your cat 2 is again just to remind people yeah so this this is again i just wanted to share with the other people so we start from this chinese remainder theorem in the second module and we will end up on the dh exchange over here all right so that's your syllabus Uh, for your category all right now let's solve a question on rsa let's see that whether we are able to understand it and whether we are able to solve a question let's see whether you are able to solve it just a very simple one and that's where we end question is in a public key system or using rsa the received cipher text c is given as 8 the received cipher text is 8 public key e is given by 13 and n is given as 33 where e and n has the meaning okay e equals to 13 n equals to 33 where e n and c has the respective meaning as we have been discussed in the class 
What is the plain text and find the private key? He is doing it. What is my plain text? And private key. Please do it. <laughs> Refer to the previous notes. Last day, whatever equations we have used, based on that, you can solve it and get the final result. Because these are the scoring areas. I don't want you to lose out marks. I told you on last day's class itself, I'll try to squeeze in a question on RSA today. So today, since we have some time, let us do that. So, remember in last day when we were discussing RS, I told you N is a combination of P and Q. But in this case, we don't need any P and Q because directly N is already provided to us. And we also knew about one of the expressions C equals to P to the power E mod of N. This was a basic equation. Okay. So, in this case, we have to find out what is P. That's the question. E is known to us. C is known to us. N is also known to us. And the last next part is you have to find the private key. See in that there was an equation ED congruent to mod of N rather like this. Phi N. So in last day when we were solving it, we directly solved it with respect to the given data. So now we have these equations with us and the relevant data are also with us. So try doing it, solving it. Anyone ready with the solution? Anyone having doubt with how to solve it? First of all, what do we have to do in the first case to find out the plain text? How do I do it? In this case, I'm talking about. So what we have is eight equals to p to the power thirteen mod of. 33, something like this. So, how do I get find P? How do I get P? What does this equation mean to you? What does this equation mean to you? Physically, what does this mean? There should be a value of P such that with p to the power e mod of this, the remainder of this whole thing will be 8. That's what the meaning is. So, just drop in trial and error values of p with starting with 1. Simple as that. Just try using values of 1 and see that equation holds true for a remainder of 8 given the conditions of 33 and 13, whatever it is. Just drop in the values. That's the only way out. Nothing else. Just drop in the values of P over here just to satisfy this equation. 
as the time is less so you will find p will be coming as 2 so your plain text is 2 and what about the next one ed this will take a little bit of time but i don't think there will be a much of a process can anyone tell me what will happen over here so like in this right hand side i'm talking about so this is like mod of phi n my n is phi of 33 how do i find phi of 33 Remember, phi of 3, phi of 3 multiplied by phi of 11. Now, as per both the both of them are prime, so it should be p minus 1 and q minus 1. So, this will be 2, this should be 10. So, phi of 20, it should be overall, it will be 20. So, the equation will hold ed 1 mod of 20, like this. And naturally, we know E. So, this is my 13. So, you have to find out the multiplicative inverse of 13 so that you get this equation satisfied. Please do it later. You will find your D should come as 17. So, your private key will come as 17. All right. So, this kind of question, please try to practice. As I said, I keep on telling you these methods are what we have. So, any n number of questions based on same data set, you will get the correct answer if you are following the process. So, please try to do that. All right. Then that will be sufficient. Right. So, that's end of our discussion for today. So, post CAT 2, we will come back and we will discuss on this fourth module. We will extend our discussion and we will see how much we can finish. All right. Thank you.